Okay, hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Karl Marx's notion of the metabolic rift in Japanese Bushitsu Taisha no Kiretsu. Now, this is a very important idea for uh, understanding climate change and the situation we're in today. Many times it seems like uh, climate change is uh, just so daunting and it seems impossible uh, to tackle. At the same time, uh, it can feel like we're just moving, running toward the edge of a cliff, uh, and we have no way to uh, stop ourselves. We can see climate change off in the distance, uh, and it's every day it's getting uh, more intense and uh, getting worse and worse, but we find ourselves unable to uh, uh, to stop it. <laughs> so I want to talk about uh, Karl Marx's idea of the metabolic rift uh, and uh, to point to some recent scholarship uh, which has suggested that this idea is very important for understanding uh, why we are in this situation, why climate change has gotten so bad, uh, and also to offer some uh, potential uh, suggestions about how we can address this and hopefully rectify this situation. So, let's get into it. <clears throat> All right, uh, the metabolic rift. So the metabolic rift is uh, a part of Karl Marx's view of nature, and it draws on the idea of metabolism, which means a process of taking and giving back to produce energy for new activities. And in Karl Marx's thinking, people, humans, have a metabolic relationship with nature, which means that we take from nature and we give back to nature. And this sustains both nature and ourselves. So there's this bond between nature and people. And then Karl Marx also stressed another kind of bond between people and people, between ourselves. Uh, and this is all part of a metabolic relationship. Uh, and Karl Marx also referred to this bond uh, when it's in its complete state as being what he called species being. And another important thing for Karl Marx was the idea of labor. In his way of thinking, labor uh, is the act life activity that connects nature to people, and it is essential for the metabolic process. So where did he uh, start to talk about these things? Well, one place is one of his early writings, the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844. And already at this time, in his early writings, uh, in the section on estranged labor, he starts to talk about uh, humans' relationship to nature uh, and to each other. And this is where he outlines first his idea of the metabolic rift. So just to uh, cite some quotes from that uh, writing, he says, for instance, nature is man's inorganic body. Nature, that is, insofar as it is not itself human body. Man lives on nature, means that nature is his body, with which he must remain in continuous interchange if he is not to die. That man's physical and spiritual life is linked to nature means simply that nature is linked to itself, for man is a part of nature. Okay, so this is uh, where he starts to outline this relationship. Man is a part of nature. Man takes from nature and gives back to it. But the important idea here is that if we start to harm nature, what we're really doing, in effect, is also harming ourselves and our means for uh, subsistence and sustaining life. And another quote from that writing, he says, In creating a world of objects by his personal activity, in his work upon inorganic nature, man proves himself a conscious species being i.e. 
as a being that treats the species as his own essential being, or that treats itself as a species being. So basically what he's saying here is that when we consider and when we realize uh, nature, not only nature, but also other people uh, to be inextricably linked and connected to ourselves, that we are not just individual beings, but that we're a part of nature and that we're also a part of society, that this is the beginning of realizing uh, what he calls species being. So I've made a little diagram to hopefully help illustrate um, what I'm talking about and Karl Marx's ideas on the relationship between people and nature. So what we have here, uh, and this is just suggesting a what I would call post-capitalism or post-capitalist situation. So ideally you'd have nature here uh, and that man over here as a fully united species being is connected not only to each other but also to nature through this cyclical process of taking and giving back. Uh, and this process itself is man's work upon uh, nature, which can be described as labor, something that uh, people do to produce something else and to make energy. <clears throat> However, the problem is that this is not the actual situation that we find ourselves in today, uh, but under capitalism, which is where we are, of course, right now, that capitalism has destroyed these bonds. And part of the way that it, it has destroyed these bonds is that, for instance, nature, both nature and labor, have now become the private property of the capitalist. And the effect of this is to, what Karl Marx would say, uh, is alienate ourselves from one, nature, uh, two, ourselves, three, society, and four, the products of our labor. And to make matters worse, the capitalist takes but does not give back to nature. And for example, for example, this can be illustrated with uh, if we think about how a mine works. When metals, precious metals, are taken from the ground, they're just taken from the ground and transformed into other things through the products of labor, into commodities, rings, um, jewelry, etc. But nothing is given back to the mine to help sustain uh, that natural environment. <clears throat> and Karl Marx describes this break, this alienation, uh, in this section on estranged labor. And he writes, In estranging from man, one, nature, and two, himself, his own active functions, his life activity, estranged labor estranges the species from man. It changes for him the life of the species into a means of individual life. So now man is alienated from all of these things. He's no longer species man, and he's just individual atomized uh, person disconnected from himself, society, and nature. And he continues... Private property is thus the product, the result, and the necessary consequence of alienated labor, of the external relation of the, world, the worker to nature and to himself. So Marx posits private property then, uh, making nature and labor the private property of the capitalist as both the product and result of this fundamental break or rift. And if this relationship under capitalism where we find ourselves now were to be illustrated, for example, it could be described like this. Whereas now we have nature over here, which is, instead of being in a metabolic relationship with society, it becomes the private property of the capitalist. In addition, the labor of people, of workers, also becomes the private property of the capitalist. And it no longer, the products of labor no longer go to benefit society, but go to benefit one person or a small handful of people for their, pro uh, <clears throat> for the, for their uh, individual profit. And all that is returned to the worker in exchange for his labor are wages. And at the same time, now this is an image now instead of species being of alienated man, 
of individuals disconnected from each other. And all that holds them together uh, is this relationship of commodity exchange. In other words, the buying and selling of goods is all that connects people to each other now. And there's no connection anymore between man and nature. So this is this rift, then, the metabolic rift that Marx is describing. Okay, so to help us further understand Marx's idea of the metabolic rift, uh, we can turn to one of the key thinkers who uh, most forcefully and convincingly argued uh, for the importance of this idea, uh, John Bellamy Foster. And for this class, we read a section of his 1999 essay, Marx's Theory of Metabolic Rift. And in that section, uh, Foster argues that understanding Marx is key to understanding contemporary environmental problems. And here he posits Marx's idea of the metabolic rift. And Foster says, the central theoretical construct is that of a rift in the metabolic interaction between man and the earth, or in the social metabol metabolism prescribed by the natural laws of life through the remo removal from the soil of its constituent elements requiring its systematic restoration. This contradiction is associated with the growth simultaneously of large-scale industry and large-scale agriculture under capitalism, with the former providing agriculture with the means of intensive exploitation of the soil. So within this essay, and within Marx's thought, as Foster points out, uh, Marx wrote a lot about uh, <clears throat> the degradation of the soil. Um, as one of his key examples of the metabolic rift. But, of course, this idea can be applied to man's relationship to nature in general. Okay, and then uh, Foster cites from Marx's Capital Volume 3 and Capital Volume 1, uh, where Marx writes, Large landed property reduces the agricultural population to an ever-decreasing minimum and confronts it with an ever-growing industrial population crammed together in large towns. So this is one rift then, another rift that Marx talks about and Foster points out is this rift between the country, the countryside and the city. And this being an unnatural uh, dichotomy that people should be more naturally scattered out uh, and evenly across the land rather than just uh, congregating en masse in the cities. And the reason for uh, large populations of people congregating in the cities is, of course, because uh, huge tracts of land have now become the private property of the capitalist, and people, workers, have been kicked off of that land. In this way, it produces conditions that provoke an irreparable rift in the interdependent processes of the social metabolism, a metabolism prescribed by the natural laws of life itself. So here's where uh, Marx talks about, very clearly, the metabolic rift. This idea not only of man being separated from nature and the soil, uh, but also uh, the results of this, of this false dichotomy or unnatural dichotomy between countryside and city. Similarly, Foster points out uh, that Marx uh, argues in Capital Volume 1, uh, capitalist production collects the population together in great centers and causes the urban population to achieve an ever-growing preponderance. This has two results. On the one hand, it concentrates the historical motive force of society. On the other hand, it disturbs the metabolic interaction between man and earth. So again, this idea of metabolism. So... Foster then argues that the key problem of capitalism is that is an unstable form of production, unsustainable form of production in relation to natural conditions. It continually takes and takes and takes and extracts uh, from nature and also from man taking uh, and exploiting uh, uh, people's labor, all for uh, the benefit of, pro of personal profit and the accumulation of capital. Uh, without, most times, giving anything back to sustain uh, any kind of relationship between man and nature. <clears throat> so overcoming this is then clearly the key to a, f a future or a post-capitalist 
uh, future society. Uh, and as Foster writes, for Marx, the conscious and rational treatment of the land as permanent communal property is the inalienable condition for the existence and reproduction of the chain of human generations. Okay, so uh, that was just a little bit about Karl Marx's idea of the metabolic rift, Bushitsu Taisha no Kiretsu, and to help us understand that, we looked at some examples of Marx's early writing and his key ideas and thoughts on the subject, and then we also turn to sections from an essay by John Bellamy Foster uh, that further explained and argued for the importance of the idea of the metabolic rift. This idea is going to be very important in this class moving forward as we discuss the uh, origins of climate change and consider uh, solutions for uh, how to prevent uh, climate change from getting any worse. Thank you.